several years ago, um, and, and actually it was in 2015, uh, we all went to the General Baptist Summit, and most of the time, uh, up until a few years ago, uh, it was be Mitchell's family and my family we would all meet there, and um, we would uh, go and do everything together. And uh, the big main sessions for me at the summit were always a time that I felt the most free to worship how I wanted to. And it wasn't really a testament necessarily to a bad church culture that I was in because the church culture was good, but there is somewhat of a stigma of, you know, you need to keep yourself in line a little bit. But when we would go to the summit, you'd see people jumping up and uh, up and down. They'd be raising their hand. They'd be, you know, just feel so free. And, you know, I, I, I've told this before, I'm not super expressive in my worship, but I can get there. And when I get there, I, I really enjoy it, but not all the time, I don't feel like I always have to be that expressive in worship. But during the summit, I would always be a little bit more expressive in worship. And I remember most summits, since Mitchell, uh, to Mitchell, I'm one of his heroes, just under Chris Tomlin. And uh, since I'm, I'm one of those, we always sat by each other. We always worshiped right next to each other. And over the years, I learned so much about worship from Mitchell, which is one of the reasons why I invited him to actually come. Uh, but that first picture that I have up, this is a picture that one of the General Baptist pastors at that conference in 2015 had took of me and Mitchell. So he was standing behind us, and um, you can see that we're both raising our hands. We're, we're worshiping God in that moment. And little did I know that during that summit is when I was going to accept my call into ministry. And uh, I remember some of that moment. I definitely remember seeing that picture and just thinking, man, how awesome is it that someone captured that of us? Because this is something that we did pretty frequently. We, we would worship together, and we still do to this day. I believe it's the next picture. This was a couple days ago. Um, on FaceTime, uh, me and Mitchell, we, we FaceTime frequently. Sometimes we'll go through a little bit of dry spells where Logan doesn't answer the FaceTime uh, but, because Logan's a little busy. But uh, we were going through all of the songs that he was going to sing. And I was playing on my guitar. He was playing on his. And you can see still the consistency. His hand is up. It's raised. And uh, again, this was like Thursday of this past week. Uh, us just on FaceTime. But then if you, if you actually know this, most of you probably do, Mitchell got an opportunity of a lifetime through what I can only describe as the work of God. And he got to sing on stage with his hero, not me, Chris Tomlin, and put up that picture. So he was up there with Chris Tomlin singing. Chris Tomlin posted on a social media. It has over a million views of Mitchell singing with Chris Tomlin. And you'll notice he's still got his hand raised. And this is what I want to kind of talk about today is I know we just had a sermon not too long ago on Psalm 103 about how our praise is broken. And we're going to be drawing a little bit of that connecting to that sermon as well. But this one's just simply about worship, about how great our God really is and how he's worthy of our worship. And when I think about Mitchell, the thing about Mitchell is, when he worships, he doesn't need a crowd. I've seen Mitchell by himself with his headphones on, and you can still hear the music because of how loud he has his headphones on, and, and he'll just be worshiping just exactly the same way that he did on stage in front of thousands, standing next to one of his his heroes of faith. And most of us, if we were in that same type of situation, we would go one of two ways. Either we would be so nervous being in front of that many people that we would kind of hunker down and, and we might not even want to go on stage. But if we were on stage, we would kind of just be reserved because we didn't want to feel like we were putting on a show, like we were the center of attention and, or, or whatever else. Or we would be ultra expressive to try and show everyone that we're actually worshiping. But Mitchell, he didn't do that. Him, when I watched that video of him worshiping, 
It was the exact same way that he does when it's just me and him on FaceTime. When, when me and him are on FaceTime and I'm not paying attention, and he knows that I'm not paying attention, it's always the same. When he leads worship on his dad's live stream every Sunday morning, it's the same. He'll always stand here, just like you just saw. He'll, he'll kind of move his hands a little bit. You'll see a few hand raises thrown in there. And then he'll start giving instructions of what he wants you to do. Sing it again. He's consistent. Now for us, we, we tend to need the perfect environment. When we went to the youth conference, I mentioned this at the beginning, that uh, during announcements, that we, I, I got to see some of our teens worship freely. That some of them, they went up, they, they went up to the front with all the other crowd, and they were worshiping, and I could see them, and I'm like, man, I've not seen them worship like this in this church. And there was others that still sat back, and they were very content standing there by themselves, not moving a muscle but you can still sense the worship. And with this, there was, there was that perfect environment that they had because that church has worked super hard at making sure that they have an environment that's inviting for people to worship. And let me give you a few things that some of you in this church, if we were to do this here, you'd have a heart attack or I would get some nasty emails or texts or calls or something. But they have all of their lights down low so they don't have any lights on in the sanctuary except for what's on stage. Uh, they'll have a few like colored lights that will kind of match what's happening on stage uh, throughout the sanctuary. So it all feels uh, inclusive. And the reason that they do that is because uh, there's psychology behind all of these things. When you have the lights down low and you can't really see that much around you, you feel more free to worship because you know that no one's looking at you. And uh, uh, pastors and leaders will say, if you lower those lights, your, your congregation will feel more free to worship because they won't have the pressures. The ones that do have pressure, they won't feel pressured to either stand still or feel like they're worshiping overly exaggerated because they can only see themselves. And it gives that sense and that emotion of, well, I'm free to worship because no one's watching me because they can't see me. All right, so that's one thing. The second thing is that they have the music really loud. Right, Gavin? Really loud. The reason that they do that is because psychology will say if people are self-conscious about their own voice, then when they sing, they won't sing as loud as they actually want to because they're scared of what the person next to them is going to think about their bad singing voice. So if you have the music loud enough to where no one can hear your voice except for yourself, and even to the point to where you can't even hear yourself singing, if the music is up that loud and you can hear the band on stage louder than you can hear your own voice, then you'll feel more comfortable to actually sing as loud as you want to. Because now you're in this environment where you're not worried about who's watching you because no one can see you because all the lights are off. You're not worried about who's going to hear me sing and maybe judge how I'm singing because the music's loud enough for that. And then you've got the full band, so you're not limited by the tracks. But you, you can be very fluid. There is a reason that at the end of the service, they were able to continue to sing without any click tracks in their ears, without uh, any uh, type of words on the screen because they knew the songs and they knew how to play them. And that was the, the beauty of a full band on stage because they could play it without any type of track limiting them on how long or how short they made the song. And there's these amazing transitions. They've worked really hard to make sure that that's an environment that you can worship freely. And in a lot of churches, they don't have that environment because they do have the lights on. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I'm going to tell you why I think sometimes having the lights on in worship is better. But uh, when, we, when we have that perfect environment or when we don't, people feel limited in their worship. 
which may be some of the reason why some of the teens don't worship the same way there as they do here, because there's some sort of limitation that they feel. And it's not anything necessarily bad with our church. It's just showing that we're a work in progress, that it's going to take some time to get to that place. But we're still good where we are. I think the worship here has improved greatly since I've gotten here four years ago. But here's the thing with Mitchell. He doesn't need the dark room. He doesn't need the music loud. He doesn't even need music at all. If you've ridden in the car with him with a broken radio, like I have, he doesn't need any music. He'll make his own music out of his mouth, sing an acapella all the way to Mitchell Donald's when he could still go there. But he doesn't need the music. He doesn't need that perfect environment. He just needs him and God. And honest to goodness, as much as all of those things of making a good environment for people to feel free to worship is important, the other thing is, is that when they get into that environment, we need to do better at leading them to where they don't need the environment anymore. Because man, if we're being honest, most of us in the room, when we're in the car by ourselves, we worship differently in the car by ourselves than we do in church. Or when we're in the shower by ourselves, like we got any shower singers, you don't have to raise your hand. But shower sing, like when you're by yourself and you know that no one's listening, no one's watching, you may worship a little bit differently than when you do when you're in here. And I think that's a problem because that's something that I've learned from Mitchell. That's, that's a problem because you're not in an audience of one anymore. You're in an audience of whoever else is possibly watching you. And for some of you, you, you worship differently when you're by yourself. And then when you get into your family and you have your kids or your, uh, your husband or your wife or maybe even some extended family, you worship differently there than you do by yourself. Because you're like, some of these people, they're going to be watching me. And I've never worshipped like I do by myself in front of them, so they might judge me. Whatever else is going through your mind, but we worship differently even in our own family. And then we move on to our friends, and it's even different there because we feel more free with our family than we do with some of our friends. And then you get into a church setting where there's people that you know because you've seen them, but you might not actually remember their name where you might not actually know anything about them other than that's where they always sit every single Sunday. And then you start having this other added pressure. And something that I've learned from Mitchell is that none of that exists in him. It doesn't matter if he's by himself or in front of thousands of people, knowing that millions of people are going to be watching him. It's always the same. And the reason that I think, and I could be wrong, and if Mitchell, you want to correct me, do it after service. <laughs> it's because Mitchell knows how great God truly is. And some of us, we, we know about God. We know what he's done. We know that we're supposed to believe that God's great, but we don't actually believe it. Because the way that we live our life shows that we don't actually believe that God is great. Whereas Mitchell, on the other hand, he lives every moment like God is great. Which is why his theme song is How Great Is Our God. Because he knows God is so great that no matter what environment I'm in, no matter what I'm going through, God is still great. And I'm still going to sing his praises because he's worthy of all of my praise. And what I want to try and help us do through Psalm 66 is to remind you how great our God truly is. And if I don't do that for you, I'm sorry. But I'm going to do my best to try and explain how an infinite God who's ever loving, has everlasting love, who, who has never-ending love, who has unconditional love. I'm going to try and package that into the next 16 minutes. 
That's all I can do is try. Psalm 66 talks about how great God is, how awesome he is. And all these things, it's leading us to know not just what he can do, but who he is. And Psalm 66 is split up into two stanzas. The first one is about community worship. So us worshiping as a church, as a community. The second stanza is about individual worship, about giving God praise by yourself. And what we're going to try and talk about is how these two should always be lined up and be consistent. Let's talk about community worship. Psalm 66, starting in verse 1. It says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. So I want to stop right there real quick because cringing to you, that, that really like hit me in the face this past week. I'm like, what does that even mean? And, and one of the commentaries that I read said this, this cringing is the enemy is actually submitting to God and joining in on the worship of the community. And I think that's such a powerful testament of a church who all of us in unison are worshiping fully and wholeheartedly, that any enemy that walks into this room, and if all of us are worshiping with our full heart every single service, when they walk in, they will see and feel and experience how great our God truly is that they will bow down and worship him too. This is where we get salvations from because if you forgot before you accepted Christ into your life, before you submitted to God's will, you were an enemy of God. And since you were an enemy of God, you, you rejected him with your sin. But when you walked into those doors and you experienced in that moment of your salvation, when you went and you got baptized, when you experienced that, you're like, man, God is so great that I'm willing to submit my whole life to him. That's the enemy submitting. That's the enemy falling down in worship to our God. And it's because when you uh, got saved, you realized how great God was. Most of us, when we were first saved, we remember our excitement. We wanted to tell everyone about the gospel we wanted to share with everyone what God had done in our life, how he had saved us. We want to tell everyone, man, I got baptized at church. And then over the years, the enemy slowly took away your worship. He slowly took away your awe and your wonder of God to where some of you sit here today and you sit here and you sing, but you don't mean any of the words. You sit here and you sing, you sit here and you say that you worship, but really what's going on in your mind is what's, what are we going to have for lunch? I, I hope that the, the pastor doesn't preach that long today. I, I'm ready to get out of here. Uh, as soon as the song's ending, I, I'm gone. I, I'm ready to just go ahead and leave. And it's because the enemy has robbed some of our worship. Because we've lost our awe of how great God truly is. Growing up in church, I can, I'm a living testament to this. Because I, I grew up in a pastor's family. So we just went to church all the time. If I was sick, went to church. If I broke my leg, went to church. If I had my arm cut off that morning, we'd go to church, then to the ER. And none of that ever happened, but that's how I, that's how I viewed it. That's how, that's how a pastor's family was. The church doors were open. You were there. You were serving. You were doing something. And by the time that my fingers could actually move, I was in the sound booth, weren't running the sound. And, and with all of that, I got so used to hearing, Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. He's there for you. You can always just trust in him. And I heard it so much that I got used to the fact that God loves me. And it took me a while to remember I was a sinner. 
that I, I still sin, that there's still sin in me because my flesh will never be perfect until I get to heaven, until the end of the day is when God creates the new heaven and the new earth. I will never be perfect until that moment. It wasn't until I started realizing how much I hurt God before I was saved and how much I hurt God in my early walk with Christ, how much I hurt him on a daily basis when I refuse to do things that I know I'm supposed to do, when I do things that I'm not supposed to do, when I don't fully submit to his will, how much I hurt God in those moments. And then as he refined me, as he made me whole, as he uh, is working on me and through me through sanctification, as we're getting to that point, as he's continuing on and working on me, so the more that I realize and I got to keep myself in check to not let the enemy steal my worship, but to always be mindful that I was an enemy of God. Yet when I came into a church who loved God and worshiped him fully, fully and wholeheartedly, that I fell down on my knees on that altar and I gave my life to him, I submitted to him because our God is great. And because he's so great, we can't help but worship him. Continuing on in Psalm 66, it says, All the wor earth worships you. They sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what the Lord has done. How awesome in his deeds towards the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. He passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rolls by his might forever whose eyes watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You've tried us as silver is tried. He, you brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. When we went through the fire and through water, yet you have brought us to a place of abundance. What this is, what he's talking about, is that something that the church does, they sing their praise to God, but the other way that they worship is that they give their testimony about what God has done through the people in the church and what he's done for us as individuals. So this is not only a call to worship through singing praises to God and declaring praises to God and telling God, man, God, you're awesome and you're worthy of all of my praise, but it's going up to the enemies and saying, this is what the Lord has done. Come and see what the Lord's done. Come and see what God's doing in my life. Come and see what God's doing through the church. And I think about, uh, as I look at all that, that God has done for this church and this community of Poole, Kentucky. The past four years, we've grown from averaging 30 to just under 90. We've renovated our church sanctuary. We repaired it without going into debt. We, we've renovated, almost completely renovated, our church annex. And although there's still a lot of work to be done, we're still thriving financially as a church. And it's not because of, of us. It's because God has been faithful to us. That when we move, when he tells us to move, he's going to take care of the rest. God was the one. It wasn't Shady Grove. It was God that brought back Harvest Days to this community. Because he empowered a group of believers in Shady Grove General Baptist Church to work together to make this thing possible. And he instilled in your heart that we needed to invest in our community and not expect anything in return, but just bring something back that this brings life back into this community. God did that. We've had numerous baptisms and new families join the church. The church culture and the demographic of this church has radically changed. Can I get an amen from those original 30 that were here when I got here? 
I mean, I, I still told someone this past weekend, they were talking about, asking me about the church, and they didn't know much about us. They were like, well, what was it like when you got there? I said, me and Chloe were 21 and 19 years old. And we walked into that church and took the average age from 80 to 70. Just that quickly. And they're like, well, well how is it now? And I was like, well, I don't know what the average age is. But all I know is that there's a lot more younger families here now. A lot more people that's giving hope to the older ones that this church will continue to last on their absence. Those are all signs of a healthy church. We're, we're building things. And I, I, I've talked to Chloe about this. I talked to a few other leaders. Like we're in a place to where we feel like we don't have to continue to be involved in some of the things that we built because we have leaders in here who have stepped up and taken charge so that while we're passing those batons, those ministries off to them, Chloe and I, we can start building new things for this church to eventually go and pass on to someone else so that we can build something new, to pass on to build something new, to pass on to make something better so that this church is continuously getting healthier and healthier. And it's all because of God. God paved a way for us to take double the amount of students compared to last year to the youth conference. Last year, we took six students. This year, we took 13. Next year, I'm wanting to get 26. Right? We continue to move And that's how we worship together as a church. But your individual worship is where it starts. Because you can't worship in a community if you can't worship by yourself. Not fully. Not wholly. As we get into the second stanza in Psalm 66, starting in verse 13, it's all talking about individual worship. I will come to your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble, I will offer you burnt offerings of fattened animals with smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell, you, tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and my high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but truly God has listened and he has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed steadfast love from, from me. Psalm 66, if I'm remembering correctly, it's not actually attributed to David, but it's one of the other psalmists that we don't necessarily know who wrote this psalm out. And I want you to think about your own life. We can talk about all the great things that God has brought us to this church. But he's brought us through a lot of battles to get here. A lot of battles that you probably haven't seen that I've seen. Some of you, you've experienced these battles yourself. And some of them I've been fighting for them. I, I, I've been on the front lines having God fight these battles for us while I'm sitting in my office praying. For you as individuals, you've got a testimony, you've got a story, you've got things that God's brought you through. This is what the psalm is talking about. Remember those moments when you're like, man, God is so great because he got me through this. One of those moments for me, I'll, I'll tell you a few of mine. One of those moments for me was when I, I decided that I wasn't going to take the scholarship to go my sophomore year and play soccer at Oakland City University, but instead I was going to pursue ministry instead. That I'd been called, I'd accepted my call, I was filling in at churches, but, and, and everything had led to me getting to this point to where basically what the coach said was, as long as you stay here, you'll never owe the school a penny. Like, I can't give you more than what you owe, but I will always make sure that you will always have, I'll give you exactly what you owe. 
so that you will leave debt free. And I, and I told him in that meeting, going into my sophomore year, I'm not going to play soccer. I, I can't. God's leading me somewhere else. Man, God was faithful because that same year, I, I, I didn't owe that much. I still had to pay some money. But I ended college without any debt. The promises of the world says you'll end this without any debt and you won't cost, it won't cost you anything. Christ said, you follow me, it's going to cost you something, but you're still going to be out of debt. You still won't have to take out any student loans. I'll provide a way. And the way that he did it for me was our local association, which I was licensed under, didn't have anyone else going to college at the time. And they sent me a check of the exact amount that I owed, $7,800. They sent it to me. They said, normally, I know we only give you 1000 for the year, but we're going to give you 7800 because we had a lot of money come in to this specific fund, and we have to use it this year, and you're the only one that we can give it to. That's God. If you think that God's not at work to put in the heart of a church to hire a 21-year-old as their pastor four years ago, as their lead pastor, not even like youth pastor, associate pastor, none of that, just straight up lead pastor, we believe in you, that's God. And there's so many other stories that I could do, but for the sake of time and your time and respecting your time, that's how great God is. He's the same God that paved a way for the Israelites to leave Egypt through the Red Sea on dry land so that they could leave and escape the enemy. And when the enemy came up behind him, he destroyed the enemy. That's how great our God is. He's the same God that when the entire earth was wicked, he looked for the one family that was willing to be faithful to him. And he said, go and build an ark, Noah. And Noah obeyed him, and he saved that family. That's how great our God is. Our God is so great that when the world was completely wicked, when his own people were rejecting him, he said, even then, even though they're still sinners, I'm going to send my son to be the ultimate sacrifice so we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore anymore. He will be the ultimate sacrifice that will cover the sins of the entire world and I'll die in their place. I'll take on the wrath of God that they rightfully deserve and I'll make sure that they have a pathway to flee from the enemy and flee towards God, towards the promised land, towards life abundant with me. That's what I'll do. That's how great God is. And if that doesn't get you excited I don't know what will, because the gospel is powerful, just as powerful today as it was back then. The reason it doesn't feel that way is because we need to be refined like silver. The refining process for silver actually depends on what kind of metals are fused with the silver to make it into the jewelry that we know. But what the refining process does is it removes all of the bad things. It removes all of the contaminants so that when we have pure silver, it's actually pure. And if you don't feel that power of the gospel story welling up inside of you, then I would encourage you and press into you. You need to be refined by the one who is holy by the one who is great. Because if that doesn't get you excited to know that Jesus died in your place for your sins, that he took on all of the wrath of his own father, the God of the heavens and the universe, if you believe, if that doesn't excite you to know that he took that all on himself, he laid himself down in your place, then let God refine you. 
Let him take out all of the contaminants and the distractions that are keeping you from feeling excited when you know that Jesus died for you, that he died in your place because God is so great and he's always been great and he will always be great. And as we're, Mitchell's about to come back up here and sing his anthem song, How Great Is Our God, all I do is I ask for you in this moment to just truly remember those moments where God said, uh, when, when moved through your life so greatly and so holy that you were like, God is so great in this moment. Remember that moment. Bring that moment back as you sing, How Great Is Our God.